You are listening to Christian America Ministries on shortwave radio, broadcasting on frequency 7490 every Friday at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Christian America Ministries is dedicated to uncensored, politically incorrect biblical teaching. Christian America Ministries' main mission is to proclaim and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and His kingdom here on this earth, and revealing to the Anglo-Saxon and kindred people their true biblical identity as God's covenant people, Israel, and their responsibility today in the earth. If you would like to learn more about Christian America Ministries, you can visit our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org, or check out our YouTube channel and Bitchu channel for our weekly videos. And now the broadcast. Greetings in the blessed holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. My name is Matthew Dyer. I'm going to be your host. This is Christian America Ministries Worldwide. We are broadcasting on shortwave radio on WBCQ out of Monticello, Maine on shortwave frequency 7490. We are also streaming online on our YouTube channel, Christian America Ministries, as well as KingdomRadioOnline.com. And uh, when this program has been aired on shortwave radio, which uh, reaches a wide radio audience, uh, most of the, uh, I'd say the eastern part of the United States, parts of Canada, and parts of Europe, it's also being dropped on those other online platforms at the exact same time. So in this program, in listening, try to keep these programs interesting. I try to get different topics and um, get those listening out there to think about these different biblical and historical to- topics that we've been discussing. And this program is no different. In this program, we're going to be discussing a word in the Bible that is probably one of the most confusing words in all of Scripture. And it is one that is often misunderstood, um, mistranslated in many cases, and it causes a lot of theological problems if you misunderstand and don't understand what this simple word means. And it's actually four words. It's four words in Hebrew and then, excuse me, two words in Hebrew and two words in the Greek, a, a plural and a singular. And that word is Gentile. It's tra- the English word Gentile. Now, I would say that most of the Christian world today would understand this word to mean non-Israelite or most commonly said non-Jew. Now, according to this mindset that people understand this word, they take that the Bible's talking about the Jews, as they say. Um, they usually don't use the word Israelite. They say you know, it's either Jews and everyone else is the Gentiles. And that is not what that word means, as we will find out in this discussion. Uh, in fact, the word doesn't mean non-Jew at all in the scripture. Now, there is cases where it can mean non-Israelite, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But uh, it actually, you have to look at the context of the word to find out what it really means and um, how that is used. And there's many cases that it's translated nations and heathen. And if you don't even know that that word can be translated differently, you won't even know in your English translation. You'll just read right over top of it, not knowing that is the same Greek or Hebrew word for that's often translated Gentile. So to discuss this topic, I invited a, a brother from named Andrew Wilson. He uh, has a Bible study that he, uh, a Bible fellowship that he runs there and, uh, and is part of there in Belfast, Ireland. And I invited him to come on and talk about this uh, subject of the word Gentile and to see what his thoughts are. Well, it's good to have you on. Um, and just as a, kind of an introduction, why don't you just tell uh, some of my radio audience just a little bit about yourself. You know, I know you have a Bible fellowship that you're doing there. And uh, um, and for those that don't know, Andrew's an Anglo-Israel believer as well. His uh, Bible fellowship there, uh, they, uh, they've been, you know, they got the... Uh, been proclaiming the Israel truth, among other things. Uh, but why don't you uh, tell some of my audience just a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So um, my name's Andrew Wilson. I, I live in 
rural Northern Ireland, so I live about probably close on 50 miles from Belfast where our fellowship meets. And uh, our fellowship really came into being because through studying the Bible myself, um, in my own time, I began to become what I call a covenant theologian. Um, in one of the churches I'd spent a good part of my life and I was introduced to Br the British Israel message. And um, I understood a fair amount of that and uh, then through CDs that I was reached of the late Gordon McGee, um, he began to you know, point out things like, as you mentioned there in your introduction, Matthew, that uh, there's these people that we all learn about in church called the Jews um, and we're led to believe that they are the people of God and we're just Gentiles, um, which conflicts with the British Israel message too. Um, so having gone through quite a lot in church, I began to study on myself beyond what I'd been taught there. Um, and I began to realize that the covenants, as I found them, in, especially the new covenant, was for the house of Judah and for the house of Israel. And it was through really the study of that that I began to have to dig deeper through this word Gentile. And I found out at that point that where I had got to had very little in common with any of the churches or any of the fellowships or any of the people that I had been involved with. And so, you know, I got together with a few friends and we decided to form what we call the Bible study. And um, that's really how our meeting came into being. And we've kept that going now for the best part of, I would estimate, about six years. And uh, what I've encouraged the people to do there is to self-study, to read the Bible for themselves. And I've asked them that you check me, you pull me on any topic that I present, the format of our meeting. I put everything on the PowerPoint, which allows everyone to read along and follow what I'm talking about, what I'm saying. Up there will be this, the references of what scriptures I'm quoting. And uh, also, some of the Greek, I will go into the Greek and the Hebrew, I'll give a breakdown of the original text. So what I try to do is teach people how to study themselves at our meeting because if I get hit by a bus or have an accident in the morning, it's got to go on without me. Um, and that's the format that we've run on and that's allowed us to study a lot of stuff and a lot of angles on points that, you know, that we find here that just regular churches that doesn't fit their format. It's usually one guy up front sticking to what the denomination teaches and uh, you know in many cases what fits with the so-called status quo because as the early apostles and the disciples found out you go against that and you can get a lot of uh, opposition you can get a lot of persecution too um, so really what we've tried to create is a, spe is a space where there's free speech you can be politically incorrect and you're not going to get into any trouble. And uh, they're allowed to disagree with me if they wish and I'll, I'll stand to be corrected at it. So that's that's pretty much a brief breakdown of how we run. Um, well, that's uh, good. That's, uh, that's good to hear. Well, concerning the word Gentile, you know, as you and I both know, it, it can be a little tricky on how the, you know, the, the common church where they understands this word. And I wanted to give a few definitions of the word using some lexicons uh, mm -hmm. to kind of open us up on this word. Uh, for those listening, you can write these down. Um, the, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the words for Gentile or Gentiles is goy and goyim. And the and it's uh, if you want to look it up in the Strong's it's uh, 1471, and then in the uh, Hebrew or excuse me the Greek, it's ethnos and ethen. Those are the the words used in, when in our Greek and Hebrew Bibles when they're translated oftentimes not always as Gentiles. Now, it's interesting if you look it up the, these words in Thayer's or Vine's uh, lexicons, this is one definition of what we would consider the word Gentile as meaning. This is Thayer's. A multitude 
whether of men or beast associated or living together of the same nature or genus. Now Vines puts it, it says here, it denotes firstly a multitude or company, then a multitude of people of the same nature or genus. It's used in a singular of the Jews, for example, in Luke 7, 5, Luke 23, 2, and John 11, 48, 50 through 52. That was Vine's comments on there. So according to these Greek lexicons, you can use this word in association with all kinds of things. You could even use it for as a herd of cattle, you know, a, a, a gentile of cattle or a multitude of cattle in that uh, association. So that uh, you run into some huge issues theologically if you don't understand that. So um, just for example, if you're using the King James translation, the uh, word ethnos and ethen uh, is translated as nations 64 times. Uh, heathen as five times, 93 times as Gentiles, and two times as people. So that means you could actually be reading the word nations, as in the last part of the book of Matthew, where Jesus told his disciples to go to all nations. That's the same word. Um, and it's actually the same word translated Gentiles a few verses over. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you think that word Gentile, a couple of verses over, means non-Jews, then you look at the end of the Matthew and it, you kind of, uh, you see it says nations, and that one's not translated as Gentiles, but you don't take it as Gentile, you take it as nations, as it was translated in the, uh, in, into the English language. So, real quick, let's look at... Um, some Hebrew examples of how this verse doesn't really jive as meaning non-Jew. Uh, real quick, uh, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And let's, let's turn there real quick. And uh, we'll make a few points in the Hebrew, and we'll jump over into the, uh, the Greek. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And it says here, now the Lord said, had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now I want to stop right there. That word there for nation is the Hebrew equivalent to the word often translated as Gentile or Gentiles. So if we're being consistent in our hermeneutics, are we to think that God is saying, I will make of thee a great non-Jew or non-Israelite? As I'm sure Andrew will uh, agree, that's impossible, right? Because the Israelites weren't even in existence at this point in time. Yeah, you make a heck of a point there, Matthew. I'm sitting here smiling because you've nailed it. That's exactly the conclusion that I came to self-studying. So Abraham is a father of many non-Jews, and it's consistent with Genesis chapter 17, which I've got open um, here. I, I use a thing called Pocket Sword on my on my cell phone, uh, which is brilliant because it's got Strong's numbers, and Abraham shall be for a father of many nations, and the word there is goy in the Hebrew text, which it's odd. I'm reading this, and even in Strong's it says this, a foreign nation, hence a Gentile, a troop of animals, or a flight of locusts, Gentile, heathen, nation, people. But this is the offspring of Abraham. And it's, you know, how can this be a foreign nation? How can this be a non-Hebrew people whenever it's speaking here of Abraham's very offspring and like you Matthew I love hermeneutics the same words in one part of scripture cannot be argued to mean something entirely different in another part of scripture we must apply the same rule right the way through and a good friend of mine that I sat next to in church his name's Ian Miskimmons and Ian taught me on state of the dead I'm not going to detract but 
he said to me, he said, Audrey, to study the Bible and to interpret it, read out of the text. So go and find another text that uses the same word, and uh, if you're struggling in it, it will help you with the meaning. And that's exactly the case here, Matthew, where you find, whether it's Goy and uh, in the New Testament, I found it where you look at those texts for Abraham being a father of many nations, and it uses the Greek word ethnos. And yet these are the words that I grew up being taught in a Presbyterian church, mean non-Jew. But how can they? Indeed. And uh, this is in the Hebrew. We'll get to the Greek in a minute. But, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't personally know how to read Greek. I, I know some, some Greek, but I'm not fluent in the Greek language. But we have a lot of aids that can help us, um, or Hebrew for that matter. Uh, we have a lot of aids that we can use, lexicons and concordances, to look up these words and understand them. And then we can even, you know, look to Greek and Hebrew theologians, uh, for example, like Thayer's and Vine for the Greek, and read mm -hmm. what they said about these words and compare them to our traditions that we have. Now, another verse Correct. before we move on to the Greek that I want to look at is Genesis chapter 5, to give another example, because I, I want you all to understand that there's just more than one example. In fact, you could, we could do a whole study on just the, the Hebrew um, view on this, but in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, and you all, I'm sure, will be very familiar with this verse. It's very, very well known. It says here, And the Lord said unto her, speaking of Rebekah, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manners of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, Many of you all know that we're speaking about Jacob and Esau. You know, I'm sure you, maybe you've heard of it in Sunday school, the story of Jacob and Esau. But what is very interesting is the word here for nations is the exact same word that is often translated as Gentile in the Hebrew. And if that is to mean non-Jew, we can translate this passage as saying, And the Lord said unto her, Two non-Jews or non israel Israelites or foreign nations, we could say, are in thy womb, and two manners of people shall be separated. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense because, yet again, the father of the Israelites is in her womb currently, and his son, mm -hmm. Judah, would be the uh, father of the Judeans. So we can't say that this is a non-Jew or non-Israelite people. In fact, this is the father of the Israelite people in her womb. Uh, just doesn't make any sense yeah. when we take that translation. And the, the translators didn't, they understood that well, as well. That's why they translated this as nations. Yeah, yeah. you got the very parent of the patriarchs there in Jacob, um, who was called Israel, who would be prince with God. You know, and to say he's an un-Israelite is just completely absurd. Indeed, it it does. the The term Israelite wasn't even wasn't even coined at that moment in time. God had not revealed it to uh, to him because he hadn't been he hadn't been born yet. Um, that would have been something that only God would have known about. It's odd because my children, uh, my two eldest girls, they're now of secondary school age. Um, of course, they go into you know religious education there, and they come back to me from it saying. Daddy today, where we're taught about the Jews and how how um, Moses was a Jew, and uh, how, for instance, Noah was a Jew. And I said, "Well, hang on a minute. At the time of Noah, um, Jacob hadn't even been born yet. And you're talking about Moses. Moses was of the tribe of Levi. Um, so how was he a Jew? Because that's Judah." Go and ask your religious education teacher these questions. And uh, they come back from school telling me, oh boy, <laughs> our teacher doesn't like your <laughs> questions. <laughs> there, was an old, uh, there was an old newspaper uh, cartoon 
in, back in the 30s. I, I had to find it. It was hard to find. I had to go through newspaper.com, uh, and I searched for several weeks actually looking for this. because I had heard uh, Pastor Peter J. Peters mention it one time in a sermon, and uh, it was an old Ripley's Believe It or Not comic, and it was a drawing of Abraham, and it said, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not Jews, believe it or not. And uh, that apparently had made stirs back in that day because I found other articles where people were arguing with him. But what he had stated in that believe it or not comic was absolutely true. They were not Jews, but often today they are uh, they are thought to be Jewish, but they're not. The Jews had not the Judeans that uh, came out of the loins of uh, Jacob Israel had not existed yet. I was just saying it's so sad the state of our education on many levels in this day and age, Matthew, that you know, those who are teaching children, whether it's men in pulpits with collars, or whether it's at school, uh, that claim knowledge of these things you know, can't quote it right and aren't studied well enough to, you know, point out these obvious facts. Indeed, and um and, and when it comes to the word Gentile, this is simply a tradition that we've held over, believing it is non. It, they, it always means non-Israelite or non-Jew. And um, the reason I say that is I have listened to Greek scholars that are much smarter than I am, and they know what that word means. And I have heard them quote in the same lecture. Uh, that it means ethnos, and you know, and they'll describe that it means nations, and then later on they'll use the same uh, word in a different passage, and they'll change their hermeneutics completely, and they'll say non-Jew or non-Israelite, and I'm like, whoa, um, how can they, how can they do that? But before we get, we run out too much time, I want to look at one more verse in the the Old Testament. To give another example, and then uh, Andrew and I will run over and we'll, we'll start talking about the New Testament, which is really where the meat and potatoes are, so to speak, in this discussion. And the one I want to look at is Genesis 48, verse 19. And um, to give a little bit of context in this passage, uh, we're speaking of Ephraim, uh, which was one of the sons of uh, Joseph. Uh, that became uh, the half tribe of the would have been one of the thirteen. It would have been the thirteenth tribe, Ephraim and Manasseh. But in this passage here, it says, "And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and he, and his seed, speaking of Ephraim, shall become a multitude of nations." Now, there is no evidence in Scripture that would lead us to believe that Ephraim and his seed would produce a multitude of non-Israelites. Uh, because Ephraim himself was an I Israelite, and he was a leader of the tribes of Israel on top of that. So why would we think that that word there would mean non-Israelite in that sense? Well... There's no evidence for it. Uh, it's absolutely completely false. None. Absolute zero. And, uh, you know, Matthew, th this is one of my biggest problems in my Bible study group. It's bringing people from the outside in and trying to teach them what the Bible's actually saying. And you begin along these lines and, uh, some I've got over the line as they see it and they're fine. What I tell uh, the people in my group is this, is faith isn't believing that I can go out and walk in water or walk in air. It's not believing that money's going to fall from the sky and I'm going to get a new yacht or a helicopter or a jet airplane like the prosperity preachers say. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is how I studied into uh, uh, Covenant Theology was I simply put away all the other books in my library, and there were many, and I set the Bible down on my dining room table, and I said, do you see whatever this book says? 
I'm going to believe it. And even if it cuts across my grain, and even though it's probably going to start to generate more questions than answers right away, I've got no choice but to go with it by faith. And if the Bible says that he's covenanted with one people, and uh, as the word Gentile, as you've pointed out correctly, says it's a people of the same kinship, of the same uh, paternal origin, then I have to believe that, and I have absolutely no other choice. You know, and like one of one of the verses that really got me was, you know, I am the Lord thy God that changeth not. And most people hear that and stop there. But when you go to the end of the verse, it says that your sons of Jacob be not consumed. Well, if he hasn't changed, and it was about the sons of Jacob in the Old Testament, then it's still about the sons of Jacob in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, as I say to people, like, you know, I've got several things that I... I enjoy in my life, and some people get upset at the way I put this, but I try to be as gentle as I can. Like, I got two pedigree cocker spaniels in my home. I got a couple of cats. I got things that I would hate to see anything terrible happen to them, but they're not of the same... They're not confident with God the way that me and my wife and my family are. And that's just... That's how it is. So... You know, this is where you have to go by faith and not by by feelings, if that makes sense. Indeed. Well, let's look at some Greek, um, where this word okay. shows up in the Greek New Testament. And uh, let's talk about that, because that's really where it comes down to the the issue because I'm sure many people were like okay well the word Gentiles in the Old Testament okay sure I agree with you that doesn't mean non-Jew because they didn't exist and when this was being used or maybe they have another explanation but when it comes to the New Testament that seems to be when we really find issues with the Gentiles because even your most Judeo Judeoized Christian out there will agree that the Old Testament was written to the Israelites and that in the New Testament, you know, God is formulating this plan with the Gentiles, which are non-Israelites, and Israel's kind of booted out of the picture. And we can't really get into all that with the time we have, but let's just focus on the word Gentile and how it's used in the New Testament. And the first one I want to look at is in Luke chapter 23, verse 2. And actually, we'll read in verse 1 to kind of get the context. And uh, it says here, Luke chapter 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate, speaking of Jesus. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews, or the Judeans? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. And then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Now I want to stop right there. Let's go back to verse 2. That word nation there in verse 2 where it says here, we found this fellow, speaking of Jesus, perverting the nation. Now, many won't know this, but that word there is the same word often translated as Gentiles. Now, are we to think that the Jews of that time and that time period in the first century would even care if Jesus was perverting the Romans or the non-Israelites of that day? Why would we think they would care? In fact, I imagine they would have loved Jesus to move on and leave their little system that they have perverted alone. I mean, I don't yep. see any rhyme or reason for the Jews to be upset that Jesus was perverting the quote non-Israelites or non-Jews that just doesn't make any sense yeah like you know on the word ethnos I remember looking this up in a French dictionary um, from 400 years ago and uh, it basically said the word ethnos is where we get the root for ethnicity from and they said basically mm -hmm. that 
it is always translated nation because a nation is made up of a people of the exact same kindred and uh, when you were just saying something earlier what flashed across my mind as well was this I'm um, delving back to the old a little for a moment is if the word goy or goyim was translated non-israelite or gentile throughout and Ephraim uh, was a non-Israelite, and uh, you know, and it means that to many of them. Then Ezra chapter ten, there would have been nobody left. Does that make sense? Indeed. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, the, the the whole point that this broadcast, I really want to get across people, and, and a lot of this is we can't go through the details of it. Uh, too much because of time, but and I'll give some resources at the end of this broadcast that you can go look up for free and read and learn about this. But the context of the passage that is being spoken about when this word is being used is the key to understanding who is being spoken about. And for example, in the context of Luke chapter 23, 2, um, the na the word nation here. It is not a bad translation. It's a good translation, and the, even the translators understood that. Because if they had put perverted the Gentiles in there, and you understood Gentiles to be mean non-Israelite, it would make no sense to the reader. And uh, I want to move on to another a similar undertone to it, and that's John eleven forty-eight. John eleven forty-eight, and. Um, we can start reading in verse 45 here, but it says, And then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen things which Jesus did believed him. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. And then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Verse 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them, we'll just stop right there. Okay, so verse 48. That word nation there, as you've probably already figured out, those listening, is the same word often translated as Gentiles. Are we to think, once again, that the Jews were, un were the Pharisees of the time, chief priests? They were upset that there was a possibility that Jesus would have per perverted the non-Israelites and non-Jews, and then the Romans would come down and take the non-Israelites and non-Jews out of their land? They would have loved that. I mean, I, wouldn't you think, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Um, absolutely. You know, this is the thing that you find with bad hermeneutics. This is the fa thing that you find when people lose the original understanding of a word. Anarchy prevails. And it it's like today, confusion reigns. Um, you know, none of it makes sense. Like, what they're actually implying here would absolutely suit the adversary's agenda if mm. yeah if it were true um, like there's a question and it's probably impossible to answer is where did the corruption begin you know with the understanding of these words who started it or how did it creep in I, I, that's what I would love to know um, is it a case that Israelite men didn't stand on their guard over the word and um, hold correct thought in the original institutions of what we know as the church um, or is this just an issue on dealt with since her ancestors left the papal church system through the reformation you know and they studied so far but they just didn't get this one over the line yeah, that's a good question. You know, whether this was done on purpose or by accident through bad theology is a good question. 
Now, uh, one thing that is very important to understand is this, this word Gentile, is, it's a Latin word. It did not exist before the Latin Vulgate. Um, and, and if you don't know what that is, you can do some research on it. But the Latin Vulgate was a, uh, was a translation that was uh, translated from the Masoretic into the Latin language. And um, that, this is where the word Gentile actually came into existence, along with a lot of other Latin words. And anytime you have a Latin word, you really need to, to look it up and try to understand it because uh, it, it can be rather confusing. But um, in that world, they used the, uh, the word Gentile, and, and we don't have time to go into it a whole lot, but what the Roman church, the Catholic church at the time, was trying to infer is everyone that was in the church of Rome was basically, they were true Christians or they were true Israelites. And they were trying to make this word Gentile support that system. So in the minds of those in Rome, Israel and Rome were synonymous. There was no difference. To be of the Roman Catholic Church was to be to and a part of Israel. And Roman accommodated all these different people, but you were only part of the, the quote, church or Israel if you were part of the Roman Catholic Church. And this word Gentile helped motivate that. It helped push that in. And um, we won't get too much on that because that's a whole other, whole other subject in itself. Um, for those listening online, I will put some resources in the description below that if you're on YouTube where you can go and read more on this. Uh, I'm not just going to let you leave with Andrew and Maya's word with it. Uh, and I'll give some resources at the end of this broadcast too. But um, going back to the New Testament, there's another, another verse that I want to look at here to give another example of how this word can be confusing if you translate it every time as non-Jew or non-Israelite, and that's in Acts chapter 10, verse 22. Acts chapter 10, verse 22. And um, let's see here. We'll, we'll read in verse 21 starting. It says here, and then Peter went down to, men, to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye have come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send forth thee unto his house, and hear words of thee. Now, as you've probably already caught on, that word nation there is the same word uh, that is often translated as Gentiles. It's ethnos. And if you translated this word as Gentiles, you can probably imagine what kind of problem you'll run into because then you would have a verse that would read like this. Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one that feareth God of good, and of good report among all the Gentiles of the Jews, or the non-Israelite, non-Jews of the Jews. Now, Andrew, what, what do you think that would mean if we translated that? You know what, Matthew, what you just said is first rate. This is how I studied myself in, because I began to apply what you've just said to this very text as I was studying and realized the idiocy or the irony of it all. And this is what I say to my people. Like, I've got, listen, I've got one particular guy comes to me and he doesn't do enough self-study. He reads all our mm. CI teachers, one in particular, okay? And he keeps throwing up, you have to retranslate the Bible. I'll probably give away in saying that, who he listens to. But he's very adamant about it. But I tell my people, look, your Bible translation isn't perfect on purpose. I believe this is by the sovereign, uh, the sovereign day of God that it is this way, Matthew, because then you have to study. And the very text you've quoted, that threw a spanner in the works for me because I, I've been a daily Bible reader since age 23. I try to read at least a chapter, if not two or three chapters a day, and some days I get through more than that. Because that's when you pick stuff like this up. And when you begin to look into the word meanings, 
And I believe that our Father has put it that way on purpose. Because remember the story about the parables. And he said that he always talked to the Pharisees in parables. Why? So they wouldn't understand. So they wouldn't perceive, they wouldn't get it and enter the kingdom. And for this, we have to study. And that's why I tell my people, when you find a contradiction, one scripture cannot contradict another because our Father is not the author of confusion. It, they must all agree. And this is the perfect example. Like that word ethnos in the Greek translated nation here proves that everywhere ethnos is used, it should be translated nation, because that's the only way that the text makes sense, is, you know, among all the nation of the Jews. You can't say uh, that there are non-Israelite people if you're going to go down the route that, well, the Jews are Israel, and as many teachers say, try to claim it today when they speak about Israel, they've almost dropped that word and replaced it completely with the word Jews. Um and I hear hardly any teacher refer to Israel or the Jews as being Hebrews. If that makes Indeed. sense. You know, and you know, I don't claim to have everything figured out because I do not, nor do I believe that. But little things mm -hmm. like this are just—they um, are—they're very important to understanding Scripture. And mm -hmm. I've heard so many pastors and teachers, and they may be right on a few points, but th when they hang up on this. It's it's hard to ignore once you learn it. Correct. I think this is key. I think this is a linchpin of a lot of scripture, Matthew, because uh, a famous pastor preach over here that I sat under for many years went around saying that uh, what we believe in the Anglo-Israel doctrine was a dead doctrine. That's what he went about and said. And he came up through it. He claimed he believed it at times. But what I discovered with this linchpin, once you realize and understand that that word ethnos is a direct reference to the Israelite people, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of a sudden you realize there's, there's nothing else in the scriptures. And... It was through that then I began to realize I'm under covenant. If I believe that I am in the faith, and this is why, as I tell our, our group, there's no point in pretending you're in the faith. How do you examine yourself and find out? Well, it's the law written in your heart and in your mind. And so you've got to see, are you producing fruit worthy of repentance? And are we living according to that? Because I believe that Israelites, I believe that we're held fully accountable. Because... Um, we are the only people throughout Scripture who were given the law. So the meaning of this word and the correct translation of it, you know, there's a lot hangs on it. Indeed. Um, and, and, you know, I've been, I've been doing a series on, verse by verse, on the book of First Peter. And, um, you know, when I started this series out, I did not intend to to talk so much about Israel. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I was aware that the the book was written to Israelites because it's very clear in the very first verse. But I was astounded by how much context is given to that book when you understand who it's written to and why Peter's going back and quoting certain verses and it's all tied together and it's like that in every book of the Bible and oftentimes those that are critics to the Anglo-Israel truth they will say that we're all about pride and that we're all about who we are just because we're got some hatred in our heart and uh, you know something like that but uh, they will go into that and not understand that what we're trying to do is bring proper hermeneutics to the Bible and understand Scripture in a way that it needs to be understood. And it, it opens up the Bible and that key of understanding the context, and the proper hermeneutics, and who it was written to is so very, very important. Uh, real quick, before we close out, um, we got about eight minutes left in this broadcast, and we are going to talk about, uh, let's go to verse 2417. Excuse me, Acts 24, okay. 17. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Yes, Acts 24:17. I was looking at the wrong 17. one. Um, and this is Paul speaking. This is speaking, Paul speaking, and we're going to read. Let's uh, start reading in verse 16. And it says here, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation in offerings. Whereupon certain Jews or Judeans from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult. Now, real quick, that word nation there can often is often trans it's the word ethnos is often translated as Gentiles. So are we to think that Paul was bringing alms to his Gentiles in Jerusalem? So his non-Jews in Jerusalem, once again, that doesn't make any sense. Um, it it just doesn't jive with the context or, or anything else in Scripture. Correct. What you've done there with good hermeneutics is the exact same thing as I watched a preacher on a video and he was trying to split hairs between the word che Um and I forget the other word in Hebrew. Um, it might come to me in a moment. But he was trying to say that every time you read that, it meant like a beast of the field or an un-Israelite. And, you know, some of the people who came to my meeting at the beginning had sat under this guy. He's, he's no longer alive. And uh, I remember one night turning around to the group and saying, well, if this is true, then Jacob was a beast of the field. Because whenever the brothers come to Egypt, uh, Joseph asks them, is your father yet a Che in the Hebrew language? <laughs> well, they didn't know what to do Indeed. with that. It, it, just, it, it goes back to hermeneutics and just looking at different verses. Mm -hmm. And I know many out there that are listening to this broadcast, they may... They may not understand what we're talking about, and they may be rather confused. And I, I understand the confusion because we are swallowed up with traditions, and there's so much that we have to unlearn, even myself. There's a lot of mud in our theolo theology that we have to literally scoop out and try to clear away so we can actually see Scripture for what it's truly saying. And this word yeah. Gentile is no different. So... I want to give, for those listening, I want to give some resources to um, to those listening. Um, there's one book in particular that I, I want to I recommend uh, for those that really want to dig into this a little bit more. It's uh, written by uh, Pastor Ted R. Weiland. I've had him on the program before multiple times. And he has a book called The Mystery of the Gentiles. Who are they and where are they now? This is an excellent book on the topic. Uh, you can actually read it for free at his website, uh, missiontoisrael.org. And it is um, a sequel to his book, uh, God's Covenant People, Yesterday, Today, and Forever. But it stands alone as well. And I'll throw out an offer there, and uh, Pastor Wyland gives the same offer on all his books. But if you want a hard copy, if you can't afford one, um, shoot me an email uh, as long as it's in, within the United States. And I'll send you a copy free of charge, a hard copy. My only condition is, is you read it and, and, and study it out. Whether you're a critic or a believer, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, so you can go to his website and read that today. Um, if you're on listening to this on YouTube or elsewhere, I, I will I'll attach two more studies in the description that you can read online for free. One is called simply Gentiles by Arnold Kennedy. And it is a 12-page study, uh, and he covers a lot of what we covered in this broadcast, breaking down the word Gentile, explaining more of the history of it, of how it got in there, what does it mean, and uh, just goes into all kinds of different information. Uh, the other uh, study I'll include, too, is titled, A Study into the Meaning of the Word Gentile as Used in the Bible by Pastor Curtis Clare Ewing. Um, both of those men dead. Uh, Pastor Ewing and uh, Arnold Kennedy, but their works are still being uh, used, and there's a lot of good information that we can uh, glean from it. 
And uh, you can also just go to like blueletterbible.org and just type in this word and study it for yourself. Now, we don't have time in the broadcast to go into it, but in the King James, there's even words that are translated Gentile that are not ethnos or, not, or, or ethn, but actually Helen, which means Greek. Now, more modern translations like the New American Standard have corrected that, but uh, that's another issue, and I've discussed that in sermons before. You have a word that should be Greek that they translate Gentiles. That can really mess up the meaning of the, of the Scripture. So I hope that this broadcast was helpful for you. It was kind of a primer, a small primer on the word Gentile to kind of get you to study it out and get more familiar with uh, the Anglo-Israel view on the word Gentile and what it truly means in the, both the Hebrew and the Greek and uh, how it's used, how it's not used, and how you truly have to look at the context to see whether it's speaking of non-Israelites or Israelites in the Bible. Now, before we close out, Andrew, do you give maybe your email address and uh, tell people about your, your Bible study? Maybe if we have some listeners in the Belfast area, maybe they're interested in uh, contacting you. Yeah, my, my email address is Andrew at Wilson, which is my surname, agri, A-G-R-I, dot co dot UK. Um, that'll get you straight through to me. We try to run fortnightly on a Monday night at present. Um, so our last meeting was a Monday night past, so we missed this week and we do the following week. Um, so yeah, anyone who's interested in coming along and and joining one of our studies is more than welcome. Um, I open it up to a lot of fellowship. So we have a coffee before we start. Everyone, newcomers, you know, they get to make a bit of an introduction. And uh, afterwards then, we have coffee with biscuits and everyone gets talking. Because sometimes, you know, people get to, yeah, share their doubts, share their questions, whatever, after. And it's, it's a good opportunity to do that. Um, well, I, I appreciate you coming on and discussing this subject it's uh i hope that those listening can gain something from it yep nope that's fine thanks for having me on matthew i i appreciate it i i enjoy what you're doing i enjoy your homing in and your hermeneutics um uh because it, it's the only way you make sense of it and it makes a lot more sense and it joins a lot more scripture together than yeah what's commonly taught in what we call the judeo-christian churches today Indeed. Well, if you don't mind, why don't you close us out with prayer, and uh, we'll wrap it up. Yep, no problem. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just ask you that you'll bless this interview. We know that you have said that your word will not return on to you a void, but it will accomplish that which it has sent forth to do. And I believe what Pastor Dyer has done today has been to uh, explain and express what your word really says and uh, the intended meaning that you had in it. So we pray that you'll multiply your word. We pray, Father, that you'll draw Israelites all across America and across Europe onto yourself, Father, by your Spirit. And we pray that you'll help encourage us to become more effective witnesses and uh, to be evangelists in spreading this. In your name we pray at that name which is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for listening to Christian American Ministries Worldwide. We're broadcasting on shortwave radio on WBCQ and over the Internet uh, on YouTube and KingdomRadioOnline.com. Come back next week, Friday at uh, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time for another broadcast. And Lord willing, we'll have another interesting subject to discuss and study more into God's Word and uh, better ourselves as best as we can. Till next time, thank you for listening. As we start this day together, fresh and new as we begin, we are mindful of our Savior, who has cleansed us of our sin. He has freed us from the bondage of its deathly grip and chains. We have entered into Jesus, joined the ranks of victors' saints. From 
this glory and to glory We can walk above this world We no longer have to worry When the devil's thoughts are hurled Victory surrounds us daily And protects us in the night From this glory and to glory Jesus fills me with his light As the daylight hours are over and those evening shadows fall We can lift our eyes and wonder at the marvel of it all Swirling planets, stars and galaxies, they illuminate the night It's a glorious reminder of our Lord's eternal light From this glory unto glory we can walk above this world We no longer have to worry when the devil's thoughts are hurled Victory surrounds us daily and protects us in the night From this glory unto glory Jesus fills me with eternal life Listening to Christian American Ministries worldwide, broadcasting on shortwave radio and over the internet at kingdomradioonline.com. If you enjoy these broadcasts, please reach out and let us know. We would like to hear from you at www.christianamericaministries.org. And also give us some ideas and suggestions for topics to cover in upcoming broadcast, as well as some possible guests to have on the program to discuss those topics. Also let us know where and how you are listening in the world. It would be a great help to get that feedback. Thank you. You have been listening to Christian American Ministries on shortwave radio broadcasting on frequency 7490. Come back next week at Friday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another broadcast. Christian American Ministries is dedicated to uncensored, politically incorrect biblical teaching. Christian America Ministries' main mission is to proclaim and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and His kingdom here on this earth, and revealing to the Anglo-Saxon and kindred people their true biblical identity as God's covenant people, Israel, and their responsibility as Israel. If you would like to learn more about Christian America Ministries, you can visit our website, ChristianAmericaMinistries.org, or check us out on YouTube and BitChute for our weekly videos. Thank you for listening to Christian America Ministries.